Good to see you all this morning. Christ Church family, welcome to our gathering. Glad that you have made this a priority during this uh, special spring season. Welcome to you who are guests as well. Uh, my name is Adam. I serve as the lead pastor here, and uh, we are so thankful that you've come. And however you've arrived, whatever's on your heart and mind, whatever life has thrown at you that has uh, come with you as you walked in here, I am confident that God will meet with you. And uh, I have been praying, and we have been praying together that he would do a very special work in you. If you know him, that he would draw you close through your visit with us uh, to him and uh, that you would grow in your walk with Christ through your time with us. And then if you do not know him and you've come as a friend, uh, we're grateful you're here. We've been praying that God would bring you to a relationship with him through faith in his son. So uh, we're eager for uh, what God will do for you. Thanks for being our guest today in our worship service. And to those who are joining in online, I'll add my welcome to you as well. Guests who are kicking the tires, I hope it'll lead to a visit. And family that are away from us, we miss you and we're eager for your return. There's nothing like the gathering of the saints, but I'm glad that you're joining in that way uh, for this season. Trust it will lead to a reunion ASAP and uh, eager for what God will do uh, through our time together today. I've got something I need to bring to you as a family, church family, uh, just a little bit of uh, an update. And uh, guests, you're welcome to listen in. You don't have to leave the room for this, okay? And uh, this is for our church family, though. We have been blessed uh, since February 9th of 2014, which was uh, just over a year into the life of our church family. Uh, we have been blessed by having a faithful, committed, joyful pastoral team. And uh, God has added a lot of people to that pastoral team. He has at times taken people off of that pastoral team. It has been an absolute joy of my life to serve with this particular team that God has raised up here. And there are three new candidates. We have both uh, staff pastors and non-staff pastors uh, who serve on that team. This season, we have three new ones that are being considered and examined and prepared for pastoral leadership with us. But we also have one who's rolling off. After almost five years of pastoring our church family, overseeing and shepherding and caring deeply, Troy Johnson is going to be stepping away from his role uh, in the pastoral team. And we'll continue to be Troy Johnson here and leading and loving as he always does, but not carrying that responsibility during this season. And I want to tell you that just because it's important for our life as a church family, but also because it gives me the opportunity uh, to honor Troy. Uh, to know Troy is to love him, and if he knows you, he loves you. But if you don't know Troy, Troy still loves you. <laughs> and I don't, I don't say that in jest. He loves you. Troy feels deeply for the heart of our church family, for the souls that have been entrusted to our care. He weeps over the burdens that we carry together as a team because of what's going on in your lives. He has had countless meetings, countless, with people coming into our church family to sit with them, to talk through their testimony of faith, to engage with questions they might have in the final step before becoming accountable as a part of our church family. And he has spent countless hours in the darkest moments with some of our church family as he has provided shepherding pastoral leadership in the hard times. So we have been blessed by almost five years of Troy Johnson's life as a shepherd. I'm thankful he's my friend and uh, the Lord has used him in a huge way to influence my life toward Christ and I'm grateful for that. So whether you know him and love him or whether you don't know him but he loves you, can we say thank you to the Lord for the gift that we've had in Troy Johnson being a part of our pastoral team for these last five years? Yeah, amen, amen, amen. All right, let's open up our Bibles. You got your Bible with you? Let's make our way to the book of Jonah. Let's go back to Jonah, and let's dig in again to our study of Jonah, the God who pursues. If you are new with us, maybe didn't bring a Bible with you, I didn't know that that would be something today, we've got one for you to borrow underneath of a seat nearby, and I've got a cheat code for you because Jonah is just hard to find in the Bible. Am I right, church? Amen? Amen. Man, I, I, I am trying to make my Bible have a crease there where it will know where to go, and I'm still struggling to get it. So I got a cheat code for you. If you're using our hardback a black copy of the Bible, page 726, bingo, you're there. Just that easy. And if you're still searching, maybe just try 726 in your Bible and see if it gets there too. I don't know. If you don't have a Bible 
and you're borrowing ours, don't borrow. Just put your name in it. It's a gift. We would love for you to have the copy of God's word in your life, not just today, but into this week. This weekend is, in fact, the the weekend where we mark the calendar for Palm Sunday, as Nathan and um, as Sean both have referenced for us already. It is, in fact, an important marker. It is not necessarily the right date. We can't know that for sure. But we do know that one week before the first day of the week when Jesus was raised from the dead, he entered into Jerusalem not with an army, not with an impressive show of authority, not with what would be assumed of a king who would overthrow the empire and restore Israel to its glory. He arrived in Israel, according to the prophet's word, on a donkey, humbled as the king who would lay down his life to establish his kingdom, a kingdom of people from every tribe and tongue and nation, dying and raising and ascending to descend and to make his enemies his footstool. This is a marker for sure. And it is important for us because it inaugurates the Passion Week. As I trust you will engage this week with the life of Christ in this particular time leading up to Good Friday. It will serve our worship together. It will serve our mission for him on the life that he has given us. And it will serve our worship in every way. But I don't want you to misunderstand. Palm Sunday is not a culmination. It is, though, an opportunity for clarification. The crowds that were there when he came on the donkey, who put the palm branches down across the road to honor him, who threw their coats and cloaks on the ground to give him a passage that was not dust, many of them within just a few short days will be in utter dismay. And some, no doubt, will even be co-opted into screaming for Barabbas to be delivered and for Jesus to be crucified. Judas Iscariot is there on Palm Sunday. But he will betray the Lord Jesus this week. Then he will regret, regret that he has betrayed the Lord Jesus. And then he will take his own life. In shame. Peter is at Palm Sunday. He's there for sure. And it won't be long before Peter will three times deny that he even knows Jesus, who is the son of David, the promised king of Israel who will reign on the throne of David forever, for whom no doubt he shouted with the crowds, Hosanna. God save us. The disciples are all there. But soon they're going to be running and hiding in fear for their lives. See, Palm Sunday is not a culmination, but it is a clarification. And the reality of that day should draw us back into the sweetness of what we gain in Jonah chapter number two. Because what is presented to us on Palm Sunday is the sufficiency of our Savior and the fulfillment of God's promises and yet our desperate need for repentance as his people. Repentance is our way. Repentance is the way of our beginning. It is two sides of the same coin, repent and believe Repentance is the turning of our mind to think differently than we were, the the turning of our heart to believe differently than we believe, and the turning of our will to pursue what we did not pursue. Repentance is my mind changing and turning to Christ and, and thinking his thoughts and believing now Christ and the truth about Christ and the, my will being affected to follow Christ. That's biblical repentance. It is the condition of our entrance into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. And it is the condition of our lives until we see him face to face. So on this Palm Sunday, we come to Jonah chapter number two. And I am thankful for one, that this is where in God's providential purposes, he has us to study his word today. Repentance is not a bad word. Repentance is an unpopular word because it is a supernaturally generated response. You cannot fake repentance. Not before the creator who judges our hearts. 
Repentance was the message of the sermon of Jesus in Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. It was the very center point of a response preached by Peter at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and again in Acts chapter 3. It was preached by Paul as he reminded the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 and verse 21 that he preached repentance in Ephesus. And again, he reminds the Roman believers that there is no way of salvation apart from the work of the Spirit producing repentance in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. And Jonah models it. What we find in Jonah chapter 2, which is strangely one of the least known parts of the story, and Jonah certainly has been Sunday schooled to death, has it not? Church kids in the room. But Jonah chapter number 2 seemingly has just a glossary, just a gloss covering over it. But today we're going to dive in because here the God who pursues relates to a repenting prophet. So let's read God's word together. I'll start in verse one of chapter two. You follow along with me there in your copy of the word and remember as we read that these are God's words for us this morning. May the spirit help us. Then Jonah, verse one says, prayed to the Lord, to Yahweh, his God, from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, O Yahweh, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited happy and humble Jonah out upon the dry land. Those two words were added by the reader, not according to the inspired text. May the word of God now move upon us and the spirit of God help us to get it and be gotten by it. Here's a little sentence you can just put in your notes. If you're putting this in your note app or in your journal, this will help guide us. And this is in fact what I believe we are to be affected by in Jonah chapter number two. The God who pursues restores those who repent. It is the way of God's people to be repenting. And it is modeled for us here in the life of Jonah. The God who pursues restores those who repent. And yet, I believe for many of us, there's a very real question that goes right along with that. And it's very simple. How do I repent? I, I, I don't know what to do. How do I do it? What are, the, what are the rhythms of repentance? And I believe there are four. If we just take the text and I'm I'm not going to spend a deep dive time with you, but I want to show you. I think there are four rhythms in the model here. This is not the only place where repentance is modeled in your Bible, but it is a key one, and it is one that we get the privilege of having now because we've gathered today. There are four rhythms of repentance. So let me just answer that simple question. How do I repent? Number one, if we go to verse one and verse two, I repent by engaging God in desperation. Engage God in desperation. Our first instinct, when we have seen and sensed our sin, when we know that we have failed, we have not done what God has commanded, we have done what God has forbidden. We have thought what we ought not to think, or we have not thought what we ought to think. We have Love what we ought not to love, or we have not loved what we ought to love. When we have related as we have not to relate, and we have not related as we are commanded to relate, when sin is seen and sensed in us, I am concerned that our first instinct often, 
when God's discipline comes upon us, when his correcting hand comes to us, when the spirit of God identifies the sin, brings the conviction, the awareness of it sets upon us, our first instinct is to disengage, not engage in that desperation, in that moment of awareness that the one who has redeemed me, the one who has set my feet on solid ground, who has covered my sin through the sacrifice of his son, actually welcomes me into engagement. That's what we see modeled in Jonah. If you, just, if you have your Bible open and you're still looking there, look back at verse 17 just to catch up. Jonah has been commanded to go and preach to a people that he does not like. That is a soft way of saying it. He wants nothing for them except God's wrath. He has run away. He got on a boat to run. The storm came and it has become obvious the storm is God's disciplining, pursuing work to accomplish his purposes. God actually works the redemption of the sailors on the boat who chuck Jonah into the water. So verse 17, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, I don't know what the time gap is between verse 17 and verse one, but I do want you to notice that what happened in the belly of the fish is that Jonah engaged with God. Immediately, he says that he prayed to Yahweh. That's the covenant name of God. That is, that is the, the awareness that he is in an agreement with God. He is a prophet of God, but he is also a son of God through faith in the promise of God. And he prays. He is engaging with God from the belly of the fish. It is out of his distress, verse 2. And God answers him. He prays from the place of the dead. That's Sheol. That's where he assumes himself to be, by the way. Jonah believes that he's in the place of the dead. When you get thrown into the water and then swallowed by a superfish, you still think it's over. He engages God and God hears his voice. Such a powerful model for us. And here's what I'm concerned about. What your relationship in human terms, in the lifetime you've lived, in the experiences you've had, your relationship with authority who is disciplining you, and then how you are allowed to or welcome to or encouraged to relate back to them, I'm concerned that has shaped a lot of how you relate when you sin with your heavenly father. I'm concerned that that affects me, how the father I have humanly or the mom that I have or the coaches that I had or the instructors that I had or the teachers that I had or the bosses that I've had, whatever the circumstance of authority. And I don't know what your experience has been most recently. I don't know if somebody has just been at your window asking for your license and registration. (laughs) I don't know, but I know right then your brain is thinking, what do I say to them? What is the right way to relate to them? And perhaps you would think of your heavenly father in some kind of lesser and unholy and merely human sense. And you would think of this phrase, when God sees your sin and brings discipline to correct you in your sin, to shape and mold you, to look more like Christ through the discipline that would pull you away from the desires of your flesh to walk in the spirit, pull you away from what is natural to you to what is supernaturally being formed in you. When he does that, he doesn't want to talk. You sit over there and think about what you did. And I'll come back and talk when I'm ready. How many of you know a phrase like that from some context in your life, huh? Come on now. A few chuckles means that I hit somebody who's heard that phrase given to their lives. You sit over there. Your heavenly father is not such a disciplinarian. He welcomes you in the desperation of the discipline. And this is desperate discipline, is it not? This is way out there discipline. This is actually a powerful moment of desperation beyond which most of us will ever experience. And yet, it's right here where there is a model of engagement. Jonah knows he's in a relationship with God. He does not, in fact, distance further from God, but rather, in the response to the discipline from God, he relates and engages with God. He speaks to him. So when your sin is seen and sensed, repent. You say, well, how do I repent? Engage God in your desperation. Speak to him. 
acknowledge the reality of what is happening and based upon the gospel, the good news that we have been made right with God through the finished work of Jesus Christ as new covenant people, we have all the more confidence that he is our God. Far more than even Jonah had. He longed for what we have received, new hearts, the spirit of God in us, the people of God, every tribe, tongue, and nation. We, of all people, are those who engage God in the desperation, not merely after the desperation. Talk to God. Does that make sense? Rhythm number one, engage God in desperation. How do I repent? Number two, second rhythm is in verses three and four. Believe God through discipline. Believe God. Jonah's theology is functioning in the guts of a fish. He's believing things. Look back up your Bible at verse three and verse four. Notice what he says in verse three. For you cast me into the deep. <laughs> That's God. You, God, put me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. Look at the end of verse three. Oh, your waves. These are your waves. Your billows. Those are also waves. Just two words for waves. Your waves and your waves. They're yours. That's what's passing over me. Do you sense the theology that's built in here? Like as Jonah is flying over the side of the boat. <laughs> I don't know how many guys. I'm, I picture in my brain two guys. One's got the arms, one's got the legs. And I don't know if they counted it out or what, <laughs> but this is what I'm thinking is going on. And then, boo! And as he's flying through the air, you would think that his last thought would be, those guys just threw me into the water. Not so for the prophet who has sinned, who stubbornly has resisted to do what God has called him to do. No, he believes God through the discipline. Yes, of course, they threw him over the side, but God was casting him into the seas. God was moving toward him. God was correcting him. God was dealing with him as a stubborn, rebellious son and prophet. Look at verse four. Then I said, I am driven from your sight. And I love the powerful use of the word yet in verse four. Here's his theology. <laughs> he has every reason to believe he's gonna be dead. Yet, I shall again look upon your holy temple. Do you know what? Listen to me, Jonah, in his repentance, he's really sinned, just like you've really sinned and I've really sinned, and we sin constantly, and there are issues of sin that crop up again and again, besetting sins or sins that cling closely to us. And then there's sudden sins where we, we don't have that one. That's not a normal one in the repertoire, and there it is. That's not the way we normally respond, but we did. And here he is in this moment, and God is disciplining him. He is getting his attention. He's, he's, he's responding to his sin. And Jonah's confidence is that in this moment, flying over the side of the boat, God is at work. These are his waves, and I will see him again. I will be in his presence again. That, that's an amazing statement. He says this from the belly of the fish and models for us a theology in our discipline by our loving heavenly father. Whatever your human experience of discipline has been, let it not form or shape or misshape or misform how you relate to God in his loving discipline for you, loved ones. Church family, you can engage God in the desperation of his discipline because of your sin. And you and I must believe God through the discipline that he is active and engaged. Are you writing stuff down? Let me give you an address. I'm gonna go read it out loud. You don't have to turn there, but I want you to have the address in your notes. Hebrews chapter 12 is such a key part of our theology of discipline. Hebrews 12, verses seven through 13. God has used these in a profound way. This was my final text to preach before a significant season of God's discipline and grace in my own life. Verse seven of Hebrews 12, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons and daughters. For what son or daughter is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Can we just stop the whole like, it's a dirty secret that God is, disciplining my life and I'm repenting, that's just part of being the family of God. 
We're not in the sweet by and by. We're in the nasty now and now, right? This remaining flesh is still here. The principle of remaining sin is still on us. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. His discipline is always to draw us more into otherness, not normalness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Can I get an amen on that? But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint but rather be healed. And if I could condense verse 12 and 13, repent. Receive the discipline of God and believe God through discipline. He is sovereign and he is active in the discipline, loving us, holding us, shaping and molding us to look more and more like Christ. So what you believe about what is happening, church family, listen now, what you believe about what's happening and who's doing it when you're being disciplined in your sinful moment, in the sin pattern that has reestablished itself when God is disciplining what you believe about him and what he's doing has so much to do with how you relate to him and respond to what he's doing. And Jonah, though he is not an example in every way, is he? In this moment, he is. He is repenting and he is believing God through the discipline. God keeps his promises. God loves you. God has redeemed you. God has called you by his own name. He has set you apart as a people for his own namesake. God has forgiven you. God has entirely declared you righteous. You are positionally right with God, even in the discipline for your sin, which is not right against God. He has declared you righteous positionally. He has secured for you an inheritance in heaven. You will not be plucked out of his hand. You cannot. You cannot outrun the pursuing grace of God if in fact you have been made a son or a daughter. Believe him through discipline. Now let me give you a quick note. If you're jotting stuff down, there is a quick note I want you to have because this comes up every time we interact with repentance. There's a difference between trials and consequences, but they require the same set of theological convictions. There's a difference between trials, which are circumstances outside of our control, outside of us, that come upon us. Trials will test and prove and shape and mold us to look like Christ, who suffered under glory. Trials are a part of this life. That's different than consequences or discipline from our loving Heavenly Father, which are in response to actions, attitudes, and sinful behaviors. And yet, the distinction between trials and consequences does not create a distinction between the belief that is underneath of them. God is at work through both of those scenarios. And perhaps you're here this morning wondering what's going on. Am I in a trial or am I being disciplined? Perhaps the answer is yes. Perhaps the answer is one or the other. And I would encourage you to gather with other like-minded, word-informed believers and allow the Spirit of God to help you discern how you relate to what is happening, whether trial or discipline. And in both cases, believe God through it. Amen? Understand? Does that make sense? Are you tracking with me? Thumbs up if you're with me. Are you here? We good? Okay. Here's a third rhythm in our repentance. Number three. Recognize God for deliverance. Recognize God for deliverance. Let's go back to our Bible in verse five and verse six. And really this is all about the end of verse six. Jonah now poetically describes what has happened. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land. That's the bottom. That's the floor of the sea whose bars closed upon me forever. And like when you go down there, you ain't getting out of there. What he's describing here is drowning. And what I don't think we think often enough about is that that's exactly what Jonah thought was gonna happen. 
Jonah did not get thrown over the side of the boat. One, two, three, chuck him over the side. And as he's flying, he's like, I wonder what color the fish is gonna be. (laughs) He had no thought of a fish. He knew only that he had run as a prophet from the call of God to go on the mission to a certain group of people and that now he was receiving the discipline from the covenant God in a relationship with him. This was not the end of his relationship with him, but it was certainly a severe moment in the relationship with God. So this description of his his drowning is what sets up his perspective. And this perspective and discipline is a powerful perspective. Look back at the end of verse six. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Yahweh, my God. The discipline that's taking place in Jonah's life is to Jonah, deliverance, it's grace. I'm still alive. I don't know what you think of when you think of him being in the belly of the fish, you know? I'm a church kid, I grew up in the church, we colored pictures of him like like this, like kneeling in the, I don't think that's how it was. (laughs) I don't know what the smells were, but I don't think he ate sushi for a while. (laughs) This is a nasty situation. He's all pickled in there. (laughs) He's in the juices, it ain't good. And do you know what his perspective is? I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm a prophet of God, a son of God. And God has been kind in this moment. He has delivered me. I'm still on the mission, which he will get on. The repentance here recognizes the deliverance of God. Jonah couldn't believe he wasn't dead. He couldn't believe what was absolutely appropriate in his relationship to a holy God that in his disregard and disobedience as a prophet for God, a spokesman for God, on the mission of God, that God would just remove him from the picture and bring him into his own presence. And here he is in the belly of the fish and he can see that God has delivered him. So I wonder, how recently have you recognized the deliverance of God and his discipline in your life? How much have you missed that you're still here and that God is still at work in you and he's still forming and shaping you to look more and to think more and to love more like Jesus for the sake of the nations that peoples from every tribe, tongue, and nation might know him and hear the good news of the gospel and believe because you're here For you to be a part of the ongoing mission of God is a privilege of his deliverance and my life is a testimony to it. Sin and discipline, repentance carries with it the recognition that God has been gracious. Here's the focus of repentance. It is on what God hasn't done. What God hasn't done is take us out in our sin and give us our just payment of condemnation and wrath. Has he not? Amen, church? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Like no punishment, no wrath. And even in our sin, having been redeemed in this ongoing battle for righteousness to be lived out, righteousness has been secured for us in heaven. And in this ongoing battle, when unrighteousness has been displayed in our lives, he has not immediately taken us out then, but has continued to love us, continued to work with us, continued to minister through the discipline to shape and to mold and to accomplish all that he intended as the God who pursues and accomplishes his purposes. Journals need to be written about all the ways God has delivered us car rides need to be redeemed. Turn it all off and just talk to God about every way you can remember where he has worked out something. He has brought your sin to your attention and he has gotten after you and then he has not left you. That's what Jonah is living in and it's a beautiful part of the repentance of God's people. Number four, last rhythm. How do I repent? Worship God with devotion. Verses seven through nine. Now Jonah turns his heart to worship. When my life was fainting away, I remembered Yahweh. His mind was on God. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. He is confident that God has received his prayer. 
has heard and responded. He now thinks of the reality of all those who are not yet the people of God, who have not responded in repentance and faith. And in verse eight, he says, those who pay regard to vain idols, those who worship vain idols, forsake their hope of steadfast love. They got no expectation of a covenant love with God. Steadfast love is a precious word. If you write stuff in your Bible, that's gospel love. That's covenant love. That is God's eternal love for his people. That's very unique. And those who have any other idol who live their lives worshiping any other idol are giving up the expectation of steadfast love, which sets up then the worship of verse nine, but I with the voice of thanksgiving. I mean, Jonah's in this fish and he's all kinds of grateful. He's having a night of thanks in there. I'll sacrifice to you. If you preserve my life, I will worship you. And what I vowed, I'll pay. Why? Because salvation belongs to Yahweh. God saves. God saves. Hosanna to the son of David. Amen? Amen. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So the worship of Jonah is coming from the belly of the superfish made just for this moment because God is disciplining, God is pursuing, and he is restoring his prophet who is repenting Engaging God, believing God, recognizing God for deliverance and worshiping God with devotion. Your sin is real and his grace is real. I think sometimes we think that we worship after the discipline and we worship after repentance or before repentance. I just want to remind you that worship is in repentance and repentance is in worship. It's like a regular part of our combo life. We do not worship to get out of the discipline. I don't know if you've ever thought these thoughts. Like, well, maybe that's why you're here today. You're like, well, things have gotten really rough because I've made terrible choices in rebellion against what God has clearly said to me. I've been buying the lie of the enemy from the Garden of Eden. Did God really say I've been choosing my own way, believing my own story, and it's gotten very bad. God is pursuing me, I see it. If we want to get this thing to end, why don't we go get a church service in and let's sing. I mean, if you can do harmonies, honey, please bring the harmonies. We got to wrap this up. We're going to throw up our hands in praise. We're going to get out of this. This is not a get out of this. This is not a get into the family either. We do not worship to get into the family. Worship is our response, the declaration with our lives of the value of the God who saves and disciplines because he is saved. So we come into the family through faith in the promise of God to save all those who call upon the name of the Lord. And we as the repenting people, having turned our minds to think differently, turned our hearts to believe differently, affected our wills to respond differently. Now the spirit of God produces in us an ongoing pattern. He's done that initial work. That's how we have come to follow Christ. And now he continues that work of repentance, continually affecting our mind, our heart, and our will. And we worship, we worship in our repentance as a declaration of the value of the God who saves. Amen, you see that? Okay, here's the closer, last verse, verse 10. And the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited, happy, humble, stinky, pickled Jonah out upon the dry land. Why? Because the God who pursues restores those who repent. There's a lot going on in Jonah. We're going to get to more of it next week in our resurrection celebration. But surely part of what's going on is a model of repentance from the belly of the fish. We learn in order to live here. So let me give you three statements to take home with you. The first is for you friends who do not yet know God as your father. Repent today with us. If you can see and sense your sin against your creator, there is only one hope of salvation. It is not you being better, but rather it is his perfect son who came for you, who was tempted like you but did not sin, having no sin nature, virgin born, the God man, that he might die in the place of sinners like you and carry the full punishment of their sin rising on the third day from the dead, which we'll celebrate next weekend. I hope you'll come back. 
he overcame sin and death, the consequence of sin and hell. He was victorious so that all who place their faith in him, all who trust him, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be rescued from the wrath of God because it will be transferred to the son of God who took it at the cross and paid for it in full. Repent. Stop thinking the way you're thinking and think the gospel. Stop believing whatever you're believing and believe the good news that he will save anyone and everyone, anywhere, at any time who will call upon the name of the Lord in faith. Repent today. Follow Christ in faith. Church family, repent today with us because <laughs> that's who we are. Let's stop acting like it's an outlier. I know it's crazy. I mean, I haven't had to repent in a long time, but this week I had to repent. It's kind of a weird thing. I've been on like a two-year no repentance stretch. Been crushing it, really. That's ridiculous. We are repenting people. So come with us, friends. You did not find all the good people who found each other to celebrate. You found all the sinners who have become saints through the finished work of Jesus Christ. We are repenting people in process until we see that Jesus face to face and we are forever changed to never sin again. Amen, church? Amen. Okay, number two, relinquish authority to Christ. Church family, this is a tug of war about who's in charge of Jonah's life. <clears throat> Repentance again will lead you to relinquish authority to Christ. He is the ultimate and the first and he is all and in all, he is supreme over every aspect of our lives. If you've got a drawer that is your Jesus is an in charge drawer, allow Jonah 2 to lead you to repentance. Let Christ be the authority over that drawer. I don't know what's in it. I don't know what's in it, but you do right now. And you've been making excuses for having it. Christ is Lord of all. Relinquish that authority again and repent. Number three, Relate knowingly on mission. We are not disgusted by or hate the people of the mission. Rather, we see them as no hope people for the steadfast love that we have come to experience through Christ. So we go on mission relating knowingly to other sinful people who are expressing their sin in however way they are and knowing we are the ones with the hope of steadfast love, the grace of God extended through the good news of the gospel. Go love your neighbors. It's Passion Week. Invite them to come with you and to see and to hear of the good news of the gospel. Relate knowingly, kindly and compassionately because Jonah is reminding you of you and of me. May the Spirit help us. The God who pursues restores those who repent. The Puritans were good at prayers and they wrote some of them down and I wanna read one of them as the way we finish our time. This is from the Valley Vision. It's called Continual Repentance. O oh God of grace, thou hast imputed my sin to my substitute and has imputed his righteousness to my soul, clothing me with a bridegroom's robe, decking me with jewels of holiness. But in my Christian walk, I'm still in rags. My best prayers are stained with sin. My penitential tears are so much impurity. My confessions of wrong are so many aggravations of sin. My receiving the spirit is tinctured with selfishness. I need to repent of my repentance. I need my tears to be washed. I have no robe to bring to cover my sins, no loom to weave my own righteousness. I'm always standing clothed in filthy garments and by grace am always receiving a change of raiment for thou dost always justify the ungodly. I'm always going into the far country and always returning home as the prodigal, always saying, Father, forgive me and thou art always bringing forth the best robe. Every morning, let me wear it Every evening, return in it. Go out to the day's work in it. Be married in it. Be wound in death in it. Stand before the great white throne in it. Enter heaven in it, shining as the sun. Grant me to never lose sight of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. The exceeding righteousness of salvation. The exceeding glory of Christ. The exceeding beauty of holiness the exceeding wonder of grace. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your word. 
Would you work repentance in us as a people? Spirit of God, would you have your way among us now to shape and mold us even through this particular text so that we might be more and more like Christ? And would you work through this text as only you can to bring life to dead hearts, to bring hearing to deaf ears, to bring sight to blind eyes, that our friends might know Christ as their savior through faith in his finished work for them. We trust you for both of these realities, both our ongoing change and for new life where there's only spiritual death. We are not as we used to be, but we are also not what we will be. So I pray that you would meet us here in the middle and guide us to repentance with your loving kindness. I pray that in Jesus' name, amen.